realize that 30 years ago, the senior universities were not very interested in community college graduates. There was a, a, a structural snobbery about community colleges at the beginning. We were mandated to meet their needs, to recognize the validity of community college education. Nowadays, we have people that are looking for a profession. They're interested in a particular program. Back then, they came because they were looking for uh, a renegade uh, university, some place that was different, easy to get into, um, that was kind of like the, the flower child, hippie type image. And, and people believed that of us back then, whether it was right or wrong or, or correct or not, they did believe it. But I don't think there's any question that state government in Illinois will be better because of the university being here. What makes this campus so exciting to me is the opportunity to teach. And so my primary efforts are in that direction. Developing courses um, and stimulating students. There's, there's no greater thrill in the world than having a student say, I understand. I know what you're talking about. You know, if you would like to get a public education that is comparable to a private education at a small elite teaching school, then Sangamon State is that public type of institution. It's really uh, going to say, look, we've come a long way. We're very proud of what we've accomplished. But we know that the best is yet to come because we are a relatively young institution. culminates several years of planning on the part of many people in Springfield and on the Board of Regents, uh, which is a one which marks one step uh, toward the realization of Sangamon State University. And of course, the big question uh, that most young people have is, uh, how can I get in? Where do I apply? What can I take? And uh, how long and how hard will it be? And uh, we can, we're now able to answer these questions, and this is what this walk-in center is for. Uh, we came out to the campus. The contracts had been issued to build the metal buildings. Stakes were put in the ground, locating where they would go. Uh, sewers had to be extended to the uh, campus. Water, <clears throat> there really wasn't anything out here but corn. And uh, uh, <clears throat> we virtually built the campus in the middle of a cornfield. We had to bring all the services in. Shepherd Road was an oil and chip dirt road that came north to south. The road had been named after the family that lived in the Shepherd House uh, to the south of us on our property. <clears throat> and uh, there were about six houses and various farm buildings on the property and one windmill. Well, we made a pact among ourselves in the early days. I think it was almost our first uh, instructional services library cabinet meeting that we wouldn't have any rules or regulations until the need for such a rule or regulation was uh, absolutely established. So that we started out with no rules at all. We, we let the rules create themselves in a way. And one of the things that shocked other people, of course, was the fact that we let the students determine when they would bring the books back. And uh, we had some very surprised people that first year because uh, we would say, uh, when, when do you want to bring this back? And their eyebrows would go up because uh, they'd never been in a library that let them decide when they should bring it back. I thought it was a great idea. Unfortunately, people like the rules and regulations. Salem State was, in the beginning, a small, small university that always had to fight for everything it got. Uh, we had to fight for a reputation. People were really eager to believe that um, that we were just this little nothing school in the middle of the of the cornfield, and we really were not. There was a lot of quality education here. 
Uh, but we had to fight for every little detail. There were always rumors about the bad things that we were doing and the things that we were teaching and how we were teaching it and how um, our students were probably not as bright as the others. But that's not true. And I think that as a university, we had to work harder to get that, uh, that reputation. And it, it brought us very closely together. And so we're not really just a university, we are a family. We came back from the June curriculum conference and we'd made our decision and we were gonna come to Sangamon State. Um, and in August, we get the phone call uh, that says that, the, that our vice president has already been fired. Uh, the, the institution hasn't even opened its door and already it's cleaning house. This is a little bit of a shock. Uh, we didn't think it was funny at the time. But today, I, I find that amusing. Uh, and th the first years were just filled with uh, that sort of uh, uncertainty, uh, c personality clashes, um, even fights, fist fights uh, uh, broke out, and certainly many charges of, of bad faith and even so-and-so's crazy, so-and-so's nuts. Uh, all of that comes with uh, developing a new institution in turbulent times. We had a number of excellent speakers in the early days. Everyone from Alex Haley, who was the author of, of Roots, Jesse Jackson, Shirley Chisholm, I mean, we, um, Buckminster Fuller, those are just a few I can recall right off the top of my head. We had some very invigorating uh, speakers at Sangerman State. It was a very consuming place, but consuming in the sense that it made you grow. There are some kinds of consumption at an institution that, that belittle you and make you less. But at this place, when you were consumed by it, you grew, and the institution grew, and you grew together, and you thought and felt like you were contributing to something that was, that was gonna be miraculous, if you like, in education. And it was in many ways. I mean, Students would come to you and tell you that they'd never been any place like this, and they meant it. It wasn't just some kind of, you know, oh, can I get a good grade out of this by saying this? They meant it. They had never been anywhere like Sangamon State. You mustn't forget that the enthusiasm of good faculty is magic for a community. We came in with a mission. We came in with competent people, uh, and we related to the community without snobbery. So this was, uh, this paid off beautifully. And there was no manipulation or cynicism in the effort because we had public affairs as our mission. We're at Open Missions University at the undergraduate level. And what we did was to try to really emphasize a very close personal relationship between the students and the faculty. We wanted to be a very fine teaching faculty. We tried to make sure that we maintained uh, that thrust by building it into the personnel process. So that if you were to look at our personnel process, the number one criteria for advancing in terms of promotion from associate to professor or from assistant professor to associate professor was teaching. We didn't say publications. We said the number one criteria is teaching. If you look at the personnel policies, we spent a lot of time constructing those policies in such a way, and those procedures, so that people would take seriously the teaching emphasis. And teaching in an, in an, in an open enrollment university where you were going to get people with very high IQs, and you were going to get people with not so high IQs, people from different economic backgrounds, and I think we were pretty successful at that. And of course we think the most valuable thing in the university is being able to apply theory into practice, and I have many students who have done an applied study term who would agree with that. It's an opportunity to earn some credit and to really experience the work world, to look at their strengths and their weaknesses and uh, see what areas they might need to improve in while they're out there. I'm now proudest of the relationship that I'm able to maintain with my students. 
I, I think my students feel like if they have a question or a concern and if it's something that they know I can help them with, they know I'll be there for them. I've had students call me at home um, with all kinds of, of questions and, and I'm always readily available for them and, and I'm really happy to do that. A faculty member who doesn't learn from uh, his or her students uh, I think is not a good faculty member. Uh, I'm not claiming that I was a good faculty member, but I think I did learn from the students and uh, came to have close ties with uh, quite a few of the students uh, and ties that I still follow. I still exchange letters. Uh, and when some of my former students come through Washington, uh, they will stop in. Uh, these are things that are important to me. Um, Sangamon State, I believe, has been very positive for most of our international students in that it, it offers the individual care and the individual um, time that is not to be found on larger campuses. And the student here knows that, that he is a person um, doing good and bad times. Um, um, he or she is not a number. And they take this sense of well-being and this sense of uh, family back home with them. It's been particularly rewarding to me to have uh, mid-career people come back to the classroom. Um, when you're talking about politics and you have people who are experienced in what's going on in state government or federal government and they're a part of your classroom, they are not only learners, they are resources uh, to me and to the others in the class. So I think that feeds back into the instructional experience very well and I found that unusual about Sangamon State, different from the other places that I have taught. If I had to uh, project of all the things that we started with, that, where we listed the stuff, what do we want to be when we grow up, what thing we had accomplished uh, that was our greatest accomplishment, I think it is in taking people, not just admitting students, but taking people and helping them understand their duties as a citizen in a democratic society. I think of myself as a pretty typical student from those early years of the university. A lot of us are people who had left school in the 1960s when many college students dropped out of college to oppose the war or to oppose how irrelevant education was or to oppose something. Uh, and many of us, as the 70s began to roll along, figured that we really needed a degree. And so we began to search for a place to go back to school to pick up what one of the professors here, John Munkers, an economics professor, would always refer to as ceremonial adequacy. And so I was among those people who was coming back to try to find and to pick up and to earn a little ceremonial adequacy. Because it, it, was, it, uh, it became apparent to us that that would help us in our desire to do progressive work in the community or at the state level or whatever level. And so I came back to school, as did many others. Finding Sangamon State was even more custom made for us, because here it was, a new school, a clean slate, and we were really given some power to create the kind of education we would have and the kind of environment in which that education would take place. When I first came here, um, I was really surprised to not see many people walking around and no traffic, that sort of thing. And I visited family housing. I noticed that there was a play area for kids. I just, I noticed that there was cornfields, you know, outside the housing area over there. Um, I heard birds. <laughs> you know, I didn't get a chance to stay overnight here, so I didn't know what it would be like at night. But it was so peaceful. I didn't see buildings stacked on top of one another. There was, there was a lot of grass and trees, a lot of land, you know, something that I really value. Um, 
And so I was really excited about that. I was envisioning myself laying out somewhere, you know, just enjoying the sunshine, being able to read a book outside and not be disturbed by, by traffic and, and noise and that sort of thing. So I was really pleased with what I saw. The relationship that I think I've had with Sangamon State University is that it's, it's almost been perceived as the underdog. And I'm very happy to prove people wrong. I'm very happy to prove people wrong with that. And in my job as a television reporter, we have these story conferences every day, twice a day, discussing the day's news and what things we will cover. And um, I'm always pushing for Sangamon State whenever we need the local expert. That's where you find them, is right here at this university. I think the professors, for the most part, seem to be very open-minded. Um, they care about the students. They, they seem to spend a lot of their own personal time and a lot in counseling. And if, and if you want the one-on-one -on -one interaction, they, for the most part, they really want to help the student as much as they can, and, and they'll be there to, to guide you or, or ask questions, or if you even have a small problem on a, on a paper or something that you need a little clarification, or even help in writing a paper, they're always there to help push you through. Sangamon State has been wonderful. It, it's, again, I'm glad that it's out of the city, per se. It's out in a rural area where it's conducive to learning. Uh, the class size, I mean, having 10 to 15 people as opposed to 200 and 300 people per class is excellent. I mean, you get that one-on-one -on -one rapport, and I honestly know you can't find that anywhere else unless you go to a small private school. In the crisis of the schools, the crisis of the cities, of the environment, of race relations, of the war in Southeast Asia, students and critics found the system of higher education increasingly unable to cope, either to cope directly with contemporary problems or to add wisdom and skill to their management. We have begun a new university together. We have tried to do more than provide credentials and degrees for personal advancement. I think we can say that our student body, as well as the Springfield community, is more alert and sensitive to the problems facing this nation and to the excitement of the world of ideas as a result of our presence. I think back in the earlier days of Sangamon State University, the formality of commencement was not appreciated. It was a different time. and there, I think there was a, uh, a real anti-formal kind of uh, attitude among students and faculty. Uh, a lot of students didn't even attend commencement, and there were a lot of reasons that they didn't want to. Uh, we organized alternative graduation, and I think we may have done it for four or five years in a row. And it was a celebration. People didn't dress up in, in robes, uh, came in their cutoffs, uh, drank beer. Uh, Doug Kamholtz and I, was a, Doug was a student at the time, actually awarded degrees. And I, I wore a colorful robe for this particular uh, time. And I think we were both barefoot at the time, but, but uh, students would actually line up and, and we would uh, give them a beer and a, and a diploma. And it was a celebration. We had a band, or often would have a band. Uh, sometimes the gatherings were out at the lake. And it was a time when I think there was a, a real sense of community among some of the faculty and some of the students. I don't think everyone bought into this, but we had pretty large gatherings. and. Uh, I think I miss that. that. That's disappeared from the campus. I, I think that we've lost that sense of community. Uh, perhaps it's just because those of us who are doing it are, are now old farts and the uh, younger students wouldn't want to go out drinking beer with us anyway. Another example of how students took upon themselves the responsibility to create campus life to help create an environment for themselves as a student body and also as part of the community that they lived in would be something that we called Rudolph's Bean, uh, a coffee house, therefore the name Bean. And it was in downtown Springfield in a building that is gone now, like so many small, old, charming buildings in downtown Springfield. Uh, but the university had an established social place in downtown Springfield, which I believe was called the People's Place. We were looking for more of a space carved out by ourselves, designed by ourselves, so that we could present film and live music, 
offer a meeting space and a gathering space. Um, and we did that. And it was an institution, an alternative institution, that did last for several years. And it was run by university students and others in the community. But there was help from the university. The university was good about helping with a little money, a little bureaucratic help, a little officialdom, to help us create some of the things that we wanted to create in the community. Building F was our first home. And in that time, we had a couple of additions to it. Uh, but it was uh, the one place uh, lacking a, a union building or anything like that, where uh, everyone seemed to end up. Uh, it was the, the greatest gossip center, our, gate, go, our Get Help Here desk, uh, that you can imagine. Uh, it, uh, everyone would come into the library. Uh, it was a, a kind of a social gathering place. And in those days, we could have dogs in the library. Uh, we had a great, uh, there was one dog called Cowboy who had his own ID card around his collar. And uh, then there was another enormous dog. I don't remember its name now. We used to follow a, a girl around. And he'd come in the library and, and uh, sit uh, next to her. Uh, he liked to sit across the door uh, uh, leading to the, the back part where, where uh, the offices were. And uh, people would, would trip over him half the time. But then uh, someone was afraid of dogs, and we finally had to exclude them. We had a room down in... Um J building that we called the pit um, that was sort of this tiered room with no chairs in it just had um, carpeted and uh, I remember one of my good friends at the time Guy Ramon who was a uh, a theater director here would come in you know we'd sit around and, and, and be we'd have classes in there students would be sprawled out you know lying on the floor almost while you were talking it's a very different environment than a traditional uh, education process. And one of the things that still characterizes Sangamon is the fact that we don't have um, any large classrooms. And that's part of the reason we don't, because we built the institution with smaller rooms to accommodate smaller classes. And we knew that if you started putting in classrooms that ac could accommodate 100, 200 students, we get back into that same mode of education that was characteristic of other universities. One of them that I can remember very vividly was a young man, a very, very enterprising young man who decided that he was coming to the university. He only had X amount of money and he needed to uh, use it as, as close as he could. And he realized that we really did not have any policies towards uh, the number of hours that you could actually register for. We were, at that time, we were in quarter hours. And so he proceeded to register for 40, 50 credit hours one semester and proceeded to go to all of the classes. And I say that because I was the one who had to then track behind to find out if he had actually attended. He went to these classes, but needless to say, trying to go to 10, 12 classes, uh, he was not able to finish many of the assignments. So he talked to, their, to his faculty members, and they gave him an incomplete. Well, with an incomplete meant that the next semester he could finish that course without having to repay for it again. And uh, it wasn't until uh, we checked and realized that he had, how many hours this young man had taken, that we had to set up a policy and decided that uh, you could only register for X number of hours each semester. Sangamon State University has uh, had a great uh, contribution to uh, the Springfield uh, area and state community. Uh, I think primarily through the internship programs uh, where students have learned um, how to cover state government, students have learned the inner workings of government in other internship programs at Sangamon State. and. Um, uh, as a consequence, I think government is better, reporting on government is better, and society has benefited from both. The legislature designated Sangamon State University when it was created in 1970 as the state's public affairs institution. And Dr. Spencer uh, 
saw establishment of a non-commercial public radio station as as a natural extension of that mandate and uh, saw that uh, a public radio station could really become an important tool of that uh, of that mandate and I don't think he considered that establishing the radio station uh, was necessarily a key educational component rather it was all tied to this business of, uh, of public affairs and, and uh, his interest was in putting together um, a professional staff um, to put the radio station on the air and to operate the radio station. Uh, he wasn't at all interested in a student station, as you'll find on many established uh, college campuses where students actually come in and, and manage and operate and run the radio station. That was not his idea of what this radio station was to be about. When I started the youth soccer program here at Sangamon State University, the phone was ringing every minute because people didn't know where Sangamon State was. You know, now we have four or five thousand kids playing soccer on our fields, and those four or five thousand people come and see Sangamon State University, and some of them, they decide to take a class or two, and they all become friends of this institution. And for us to grow, we needed the Springfield community to be friends. The development of a performing arts complexes in the city goes, goes way back. And they used to have a, a theater in town, a vaudeville house, uh, quite uh, glorious, I'm told. And it was torn down. And the, the community d did not have a performance facility. It had a symphony. It had other th uh, performing groups in the community, but no one place they could all go. Uh, the Prairie Capital Convention Center, which was a part of a separate project, was going to have uh, a small theater attached to it, uh, maybe four, five, six hundred seats. And uh, those uh, movers and shakers in the community said, it's too small. We, it's not big enough for our symphony. It's not big enough for our ballet company. It's not big enough for, for what we want this community to have. And that was, uh, that was accurate. So at the time, the Public Affairs Center was being constructed, in fact, in the midst of construction, the auditorium was conceived as a performance space. And the community leaders, in fact, some people who were involved with the uh, Prairie Capital Convention Project, actually went to the governor and the legislature and uh, appropriated additional funds to expand what was going to be virtually a 1,000-seat lecture hall into a 2,000-seat facility. And uh, the biggest crowd we've ever had at the observatory, we had an eclipse on February 26th in 1979, a partial eclipse of the sun. Well, two things happened to make this very popular. Number one, it was the prettiest day we'd had in a month, just absolutely gorgeous sunshine and not very cold. It was absolutely clear. And number two, all the schools are off because of teachers meeting. So all the kids are available and their parents didn't know what to do with them, so they brought them out here. We had 3,500 people show up for that eclipse event. <laughs> The program that is unique to us is the Illinois Legislative Staff Intern Program. And that program um, brings in about 20 students each year, and they are divided among the partisan staffs and uh, the Legislative Service Agency. Uh, so that tied in with my interests as an educational program that engaged people not only in, with ideas but also with activity. In 1975, I think it was on the 6th of December, we moved from our friendly old Building F uh, to the new Brookins Building. And we always tried to make a distinction that the, the, the building itself was the Brookins building, but the library was a part of that building. The idea was that as the library expanded, the classroom office side would get smaller, and it has, and the library would the ultimately uh, occupy the entire building. We don't do that yet. But it was a big change to move into a proper brick building uh, with elevators and copying rooms and so forth. It was great in many ways because at that time we were storing books in the basement of the old Leland Hotel and uh, had to have one day delivery to pick up those things. Uh, but um, 
In another way, it changed the whole dynamic of the place that the library had on campus. With our move away from the little brown butler buildings on the east side of campus, uh, we seem to lose that uh, feeling of being the crossroads of the university. Soccer then became uh, of interest to the campus and it was felt uh, that we were going to need a, a soccer stadium for, uh, <clears throat> for an intercollegiate soccer team. And uh, the physical plant was assigned the job of building the soccer stadium. <clears throat> and uh, Aiden Gonelson, who is our enthusiastic soccer uh, coach, was able to get a uh, local fence uh, 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 company uh, owner to build, to provide the fence around the facility. And uh, the local Kiwanis Club <coughs> committed to donating $40,000 for the purchase of bleachers. And that's, they cost that kind of money, they're expensive. So the university set about grading the land by, uh, with its own ground forces. We borrowed two uh, scrapers, uh, paddle wheel scrapers, from a local developer who, who donated two or three days time and, um, and operators uh, to operate these scrapers so that we could form the crown for the field and our own grounds force uh, graded it with an old grader they had, raked it, installed underground drainage, and then uh, uh, about $5,000 or 5,000 yards where the sod was purchased. And the soccer team and a lot of the local volunteers uh, actually laid the sod. In 86, uh, we won the national championship and spring of 87 by virtue of winning the NAIA national championship we were invited to participate in the World Collegiate Soccer Championship in Las Cruces, New Mexico. And in the uh, semis we played UCLA. They were the representative of NCAA Division I. And I remember being interviewed on FNN Sports. Uh, the game was covered nationwide on FNN and the, uh, the person uh, apologized, says, I'm sorry, but where is Sangamon State University, you know? I said, well, Springfield, Illinois. So that was, an, a, you know, that was national coverage. So with the very, very few dollars that this university has spent over the years, uh, the soccer program in particular has provided the university with thousands and thousands of dollars of uh, um, exposure and good publicity. You know, sometimes you can have bad publicity, but all the years that uh, we've been here, 18 years, we've not had any bad publicity. Everything was good, and I feel proud of that. There was a director of theater here at Sangamon State named Guy Roman. Guy Roman was French, about as French as you could get. Guy had participated in the resistance, and uh, he was um, outspoken, I think, is probably the kind way of putting it. Some people would probably say some other sort of meaner words around it, but I think outspoken is probably the way Guy was. Um, he knew what he wanted. He knew what he needed. And he was the director of theater at Sangamon State. By 1980, um, Guy had sort of ceased doing theater as a, as a regular routine at SSU. They had not committed the resources to it. And he was also suffering from some ill health. Um, and he decided he wanted to do a play. And he decided to do Antigone and uh, the Greek play. But this was actually the French rewrite of it for the Second World War to show the Nazis what kind of beasts they were while they were occupied and yet not be speaking directly to the Nazis so they wouldn't know. And given how stupid the Nazis were, I don't think they probably did realize what was going on. And so Creon uh, is a very large part of that play, and I took that part. And we did that particular production in a classroom over in G building. I think it was G 47 or 37 or something like that. It was where the old assembly uh, used to meet. People then asked me if, um, in the administration, asked me if I might be interested in doing directing of theater, or that perhaps Guy and I could co-bring this back to the university. And I had agreed to that after talking with Guy. 
And in the interim, I then was scheduled to go on a faculty exchange program. And then when I came back, uh, unfortunately, Guy had passed away in that period of time. Uh, he died of a heart attack. And so the theater stuff was put on hold for a little longer. <clears throat> the fact that student housing was constructed on campus has, in fact, changed the nature of the campus. It, it has given it more of a residential feeling to the campus. Uh, the housing units uh, are of good quality and uh, of, uh, attractive to students. They like the housing. Our, our, the average age of our students is still high, but I think the younger students tend to live in on-campus housing. Uh, it provides a place for students uh, who move to Springfield to at least start out in, so they can start out in on-campus housing, then if they decide, they can move into the community, but there's a place to start right on campus. They gathered at noon today at Sangamon State University for a short rally, the 50 or so making the trip to Washington, plus a small group of supporters. They heard from several speakers, all of them denounced the war in one way or the other and called for an immediate withdrawal of all American troops from Indochina. The trip was organized during the last week by Larry Golden, a Sangamon State faculty member, but he emphasized that this activity was in no way sponsored by the university. Sangamon State opened in the middle of campus violence all over the country, and basically this was a pretty quiet place. Uh, we always thought partly was because our students were older, and I think that the real reason was there wasn't much to really rebel against. This You could pretty much do what you wanted. There weren't any real codes. At that point, we didn't have any housing. Uh, people were here to get an education and take part in what was going on, and we didn't have the kind of campus life that uh, maybe would have spawned some of those uh, demonstrations. It was it was a very fun place to be, but it certainly and it was radical. But it cer we certainly didn't have any demonstrations. So I think it's probably appropriate that Sangamon State is also a very political institution. I think a lot of most universities actually are very political, uh, and for people who enjoy being involved in politics, it presents opportunities and and challenges. Uh, for people who don't enjoy it, and some don't, they can go in their offices and they can shut the door and they can work on their computer and they don't have to get involved in it. But if you, if you like to help determine your own future and uh, you like to be involved in setting policies and uh, being a part of change, uh, I think it's a, it's a very exciting opportunity for faculty and staff on this campus. So I think I see it as a positive, I guess, more than anything else. I will tell you that Sangamon State is a place where passions have always run high. And one of my uh, fondest recollections of our early years was a faculty dispute between two faculty members which spilled over into the parking lot of the university it was a shouting match which ultimately ended in a duel, a challenge to a duel. And these two faculty members were to meet one another with weapons of choice, but fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you viewed those two faculty members, the duel was canceled when wiser heads prevailed and called off what was to have been a fight to the death. It happened at Sangman State. Well, uh, as you know, when I first arrived here, there was, there was tremendous uh, tension because of management labor relations. And uh, the first few months I was here, as here, I wondered how are we going to heal this when everyone just wanted to bring up the past and so forth. And then a, a union member actually suggested that we bring in an outside group to help us. And among the groups that were mentioned was a group out of Harvard, and they had been involved in settling the detention the and the war in Nicaragua. So I decided if they could do Nicaragua, they were ready for us. Another thing that happened that nobody knows about was when I drove in one morning, uh, there was a vice president of mine, the vice president for business affairs, Tom Goines, was at the flagpole lowering a dummy that had been 
hoisted to the top of the flagpole, which was the president. They had made a dummy of the president and had hung me in effigy up there. And Tom got to the campus 10 minutes before I did and was busily taking it down and then running into the building with a full-size dummy in his arms. And I thought this was a joke. <laughs> I said, well, leave it up. You know, people will be amused. Sangamon State is an upper-level institution that has brought to Springfield a place to debate and to discuss the state of Illinois, public affairs in the state of Illinois, how the state of Illinois runs, what political impacts are felt here in Springfield that affect us all. One thing we can be most proud of is that given the structure of this institution, you know, we have given access to education to people who normally would not have had this access. You know, most of our students, I would suggest, are working full time. And by having this type of institution here that caters to working students in which they can go to school at night, I think this is a major accomplishment. I think a lot of faculty, perhaps, who, who have only taught at Sangamon State, perhaps don't realize as much as some of us who taught other places just how unique this place is. Uh, the, uh, the ability uh, and the opportunity that Sangamon State gave me to change my job, which I did. I changed my, literally changed my job here while still staying in my professorial uh, position at Sangamon State. Uh, but I was able to change my job based upon what my interests were, what was going on in the world. To be able to do that uh, in one place of employment for anybody, not just academics, but for anybody, is a real blessing. I mean, there's very few places in this world where you can maintain employment uh, at one place for 23 years or so and do the variety of things I've done at Sangamon State University and many other people have done. Uh, I'll, I'll be for eternally grateful to this university for that opportunity. Now I say with uh, deep emotion, and for the last time, I thank all of you on behalf of Sangamon State University. One of the major accomplishments in my perspective is the nearly uniform pride that the faculty and staff take in this institution. Its recent change or adoption by the University of Illinois to become the uh, University of Illinois-Springfield will not change much of that because the tone and style has been set by now 25 years of teaching and of loyal alumni who think we do a good job here and we have done a good job here. So I don't think you can take that away. I hope Sangamon State will be remembered as a school that has had an influence on public policy, a wholesome influence on public policy. And I hope that 10 years from now, 20 years from now, when someone is elected governor and that person who is really dedicated to improving state government, he looks around and says, where are the resources to really lift this state? And he can look at Sangamon State University and say, here are some resources that we can use. We are so proud of what we have accomplished in 25 years. We want to recognize all those who have contributed to the building of this great institution. And our 25th anniversary also gives us an opportunity to look toward our future because we're very confident that for us, the best is yet to come. <laughs>